back elevations are high, we don't want to touch the cornea. So besides the back elevation and the pachymetry, now the most important thing is the epithelial mapping. The mapping of the epithelium, the pattern of the epithelium normally is very thick, very thin on top and thick below. That is the normal pattern, thin, thick. Sometimes your whole cornea might be very, very normal. Your topographs might be normal. Your back elevations are good. Corneas might be thick, but the epithelial pattern might be just opposite. Then you know suddenly something is wrong with this cornea. The epithelial pattern is very, very important. It is a big marker. What we use in Tilganga is the Optiview, but now there are other scanners like Artemis, they, they do a lot of research on epithelium. So epithelium is very important. So if you look at this, if your epithelium is thin, over a thin part of the cornea, it is definitely ectasia there, definitely. And there are other things, there are other evaluations. We also do the higher order aberrations the high RMS, there's so many other, the coma, the spherical aberration, they're all that thing, okay? Especially the point spread function. If you just look at a point spread function and the high order aberrations, that will also give us a, an idea that the patient is fit or not fit for surgery. On top of that, we also do contrast sensitivity. We don't do color vision and all that, okay? So, what, you, what, what, what I'm trying to tell you is one scanner is not enough to diagnose this patient saying this is okay, this patient is normal for surgery. Or one scan is not enough to say that this patient is not fit for surgery because you have to correlate all the different scanners. Okay, so you want an actual topograph, you want sagittal maps, white to whites, you want to see the back elevation coinciding with the epithelial thickness and the epithelial Mapness of maps over there. So this is what is happening. I'm just showing you a scan over here. This is a very steep scan. So the moment we see steep scans, we get very, very worried. So this is a very steep scan over there. Front elevation, the back elevation is very high, the cornea is thin, and you see this is the epithelium that is thin over the thinnest part of the Cornea. So this is what keratoconus, these are the correlations. So it is very difficult to get. So what I usually see in my clinic is the epithelial map and the back elevation. That is very, very important. So if you are sending your patient to anybody, you have to find out whether the surgeon is seeing back elevations and epithelial maps, okay? So let's go to one more, one more example over here. So this is a very normal scan, see? This is a number eight pattern, this is normal. The front elevation, the back elevation not too much. And you see the epithelial pattern, can you see the epithelial pattern? It is thin, the blue one is thin and thick. Okay, so it means that this is a normal pattern. But, you see that this is a suspect keratoconus, front elevation is high, back elevation is high, and the epithelium is thin, this is keratoconus. This looks a little normal over here. The front elevation is okay, but there is back elevation here, and the epithelium is very thin. That means, though it looks normal, this is keratoconus over here. And subclinical again, this is, looks okay to me, okay, but this is a normal pattern. Front elevation is okay, the back elevation is okay, and the epithelial pattern, thin on top, thick below. You look at this, this is a very, very normal pattern over here, and then you have normal front elevation, but there's a little bit of back elevation and the epithelial pattern. So this can be very, very misguiding. You can have a very normal atlas corneal topograph, and you can miss out on the epithelial pattern and the back elevation. And if you do surgery on these patients, that's it and three months time they'll come back. This is what you need to find out. Who is doing the back elevations and the epithelial map? This is very, very important. 
Now worldwide, this has been a standard mode. Like you want to see the corneal thickness, you want to see back elevations, and you want to see the epithelial maps. So uh, again, like you know, it might be too expensive for the patients, but when you think about it, like you know, how much money in Kathmandu a smile procedure just costs a thousand US dollars, okay? But I'm sure. My friends over here, you all have sold glasses in $650, progressive glasses or something like that. You've sold glasses in $500. Over, over a lifetime, can you imagine the amount of money that a patient spends on glasses? So if you talk about expenses, it's pretty cheap actually. But still, it's not only on glasses, it's about the quality of life. See, I had LASIK seven years back, okay? My life changed. I waited for five years to do LASIK because I was so scared. At the age of 45, I started having presbyopia. And last month, I went and did I, an announcement. I'm OK now. I can read. So you can always tell your patients that, OK, there is going to be presbyopia. But you can also add a little bit of laser later. You can also enhance. You can still enhance. So do you think it is a cosmetics? Not always, OK? So when people say it is a cosmetic surgery, it doesn't have to be a cosmetic surgery. So for my life, if you think about anybody after minus 6, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing that you do is re put your hand out, and that's your glasses that you need. Minus 8, you wake up at night, even if you, you, know, you want to go to the toilet, you need your glasses. So it's just like a lame guy who is using crutches. A person who doesn't have legs needs crutches to go to the toilet. A person minus eight is the same thing. He needs his glasses to go to the toilet. So I, I, I don't put it as cosmetic. There are other factors. In Nepal, there are so many people who cannot even afford a pair of glasses. OK? For those people, we've even done it for free. So we put in a concept like, OK, we take charge a little bit more, the people who can pay, and then we subsidize on the people who cannot pay. There are people in the mountains. You know how Nepal is. You go to people in Dolpar. A guy who is wearing, wearing minus six and his glass breaks, he has to wait for a guy to take his glass to Nepal Ganj, who has to walk for four days and four days back. That's nine days, one day to make the glass. So nine days he's blinded without glass. So you can imagine what his life is like. OK? So these are the people we try and do surgery, but not zabardasti. Not we have to make sure that the scans are OK. So now at the end, I would say we have a normal gram calculator. I don't know. Should I press on something just to make it work? <coughs> So this is a normogram that we use. This has been designed by Professor Dan Reinstein. I used to work with him in London at the London Vision Clinic. It took him 10 years to make. He doesn't give it to anybody. He gi he's given it only to Nepal. So this is just a calculation just to keep ourselves safe. You know, it tells us. I think Puru can just show it over because I don't have uh, anything to type. So there are two lines over here. One is what we feed in. And one is, this is an actual sheet, which is actually 900 pages long. Yeah? If you just scroll down, it's 900, but you just want to. So this is telling us how safe it is and things like that. You know, you want to put down the prescription. And on this side, you want to check on the RST, the residual stromal tissue. But in LASIK, it is important. But in SMILE, the RST is not at all important. You want more cornea on the anterior surface. Things have changed. It's become totally different now. The ones that you're reading in the book, it's totally different. We don't want more cornea on the back. We don't want more residual stroma. We want more cornea strong in the front, the anterior stroma. So nowadays, like, SMILE is getting more and more and more popular. In fact, FDA has approved SMILE in the US, and the FDA has also approved yesterday SMILE with cylinders. So, so the most important thing for me 
I try and find the smallest reason to cancel my patient. It's like just the opposite. You're trying to just rule out things so that you can do surgery. But for me, it's just the opposite. I try and find the smallest reason not to take chances over here. Because if you have one problem, one ectasia, one disenteration, or one patient with ghosting or something like that, and if a patient is 25 years old, it's a problem for another 65 years. So I'm very, very particular. So it has to be the same with you. So every patient, I'm really, really particular in screening. And safety is the first thing. Thank you very much. <laughs>